Hi, it's Marcus Keane here from Salford Memories, and as I said, we've got an interview today. It's of our special guest, and it's Mr. Paul Shuttleworth. Hello. Should I be nervous? No. <laughs> we're live, aren't we? Yeah. Right, please well, do not swear. Paul. No, no. So today, <laughs> so today, um, the interviewer is being interviewed. <laughs> yes, which is surreal. Different. But yeah, we'll give it a go. Yeah. So um, we're here today because it's because um, it's Talford 50 this year. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about um, Talford, about all about Talford, growing up in Talford, different parts of Talford and things like that. So how did you come to be in Talford? Well, for me, um, my first job from leaving school was at Birmingham Ice Rink in Birmingham City Centre. Um, and they closed it in 1988 when I was 16 and I was absolutely devastated. I love the job to bits. Mom said, you're not leaving for nothing, get in the shop. So I ended up going into the family business of hairdressing because there was nothing else I could do to, to survive. And mom says, it's that or nothing. And then a year later, when I was 17, I passed my driving test. One of the first places I drove was to that building behind us, which was Telford Ice Rink, and said, give us a job because I just loved ice skating. That was my thing. Um, and they did. They gave me a part-time job and then about 18 months later I became DJ and promotions manager and that's where my feet got firmly under the Telford table as it were. Yeah. So I used to lodge with a friend Rita's just over in Hollingswood. You could walk over to the ice rink yeah. and skating's always been my lifeblood. I can remember skating here when I played for Birmingham as a visiting team. They used to have a recreational tournament every summer and we used to play and drink beer and then come and kick a ball around in the town park. And the town park was very different then because the lake was right in front of the ice rink. So whenever it was your birthday, you got chucked in the lake, whatever the weather. Yeah. And um, yeah, there was an awful lot of history around the ice rink. That was in the early 90s. And I was sort of the DJ there. And the radio all came about because Beacon used to do radio road shows in the school holidays at the ice rink. Yeah. So that's how they kind of found me and said, oh, do you want to come and do some stuff for us? And that's how the radio career was born. But everything stems back to me coming to the ice rink and said, any chance of having a job? And at the, my, my first gig there was handing out skates, sweeping up. And I even got to drive the Zamboni, which was probably the yeah. coolest vehicle yeah. I've ever driven. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was ice skating and the love of it that brought me here because having skated in Birmingham, Solihull isn't that far, yeah. but it's like tribal rivalry. It was like Brummies never skated in Solihull and Solihull skaters never skated in Birmingham. It was, yeah. it was like football tribalry. Yeah. And I quite frankly would rather drive to Telford than go to y your arch enemy place. Yeah. And that's how I got involved in Telford. And I've always loved it here. The intention was to come here, earn a bit of money, get myself settled, get somewhere to live back home. And as I'd been here for a couple of years, I suddenly realised that you could buy an X3 bedroom council house in Dorley, what you could get a one bed apartment in Sutton Coalfield for. Yeah. And it was a nicer place to live. I mean, Sutton has, has lots of airs and graces, but it doesn't have the greenery, it doesn't have the town park, it doesn't have the convenience of Telford. Because you hear people from Shrewsbury sometimes give it a hard time. Yeah. But those same people are still in town on a Saturday doing the shopping because it's easier to get in and out. If, if a road gets blocked in Telford, you just go the other way. Yeah. It, it, Telford is built around the town park, which is circular. So if there's a road block just in Hollingswood, you can go through Mallonsley and round the other way. or like this. There's lots of alternative routes. So a traffic jam in Telford is never much more than half an hour because you yeah. can just go the other way. Whereas in, Telf uh, in Shrewsbury, with all those narrow lanes, if the road gets blocked, you're there for hours, hours and hours. Yeah. And, hours. and it was like that in Birmingham. I mean, I could get from my mum's house to Telford quicker than I could get from my mum's house to Warsaw because it was much closer. But the traffic was just a nightmare. So with the house prices, what they were, I mean, it was 94. I bought an ex-council semi in Dorley um, on the Lee, just off Finger Road. Yeah. And I bought that for £34,000 in 94 which blew my mind in the fact that it got me on the housing market. Yeah. And as I lived there, I got lots of friends that I worked with here at the ice rink living around that area. And it, it just, it felt like home. And now the intention is that I stay here. I, I Telford runs through the blood now. Yeah. And it, it's very much a mongrel town. So everybody has got family roots, either of their generation or the generation before, somewhere else, be it Liverpool, Birmingham, wherever, yeah. anywhere. Because it was one of those places you came, but it was one of those places you could set up home. And now, when my relatives and my sister, who still lives in Sutton Caulfield, come here, they think this is way better than they've got down there yeah. in terms of 
the, the, the new builds and the construction and the town park and the mixture of greenery and the fact that you're a very short drive from being in the middle of the countryside or from the Reekin or from Ironbridge which has got all that history and the museums and there's always something to do in Telford and often when you're here you get a bit blasé about what we've got around us but we've got such a mixture of things to do and things to see and people who are passionate about it as well, people who really care about it, whether it's somebody who's born and bred in Maidley or Dawley or Wellington or one of the market yeah. towns, or whether you've been here five or six years, you feel like you own it, you feel like you're part of it. And I think it's worth pointing out from my point of view that Telford and Reekin as a council are quite a young council. Yeah. They, they understand social networking, they understand marketing, they understand PR, they understand how you've got to make money to survive and actually when you look at some of the councils that are run by the more silver-haired generation yeah that don't get that modern technology it holds those towns and, and areas and county councils back and the fact that Telford and Regan are so forward-thinking I know it can annoy people from time to time because they're all oh, they're building this and they're doing that yeah. but actually they're investing in our and our kids and our grandkids future yeah because if you look around this town park now compared to what it was when i first came here sort of 25 years ago yeah okay the big slide's gone yeah okay the the the, the big spider web's gone but look at what they've got now they've got water parks they've got climbing walls there's extra lakes there's all the restaurants of south water there's all the extra accommodation there's the international center which is now becoming a center in terms of outside of birmingham and london this yeah. is a destination. The events are choosing to come here rather than go to Birmingham because it's cheaper and it's accessible and they've got accommodation, which is putting money into our businesses' pockets, whether they be local businesses or hotels or whatever. It's got people travelling into the town. And yes, of course, it can be inconvenient when you've got a few thousand vehicles to put up with, but it's bringing money into the economy. They're spending their pounds here whether it's on food, drink or accommodation, rather than in Birmingham or London or Manchester. And that's so important, particularly when the economy is as difficult as it is now. And I yeah. think we've got, I know that from time to time it seems difficult, but I think this town has got an awful lot to be thankful for. When you look at all the events that went on from Telford 50, whether they were tiny little community centres, having a bit of a fun day and, I don't know, making some sand art or drawing on mugs or stuff, to the big event that we had last weekend as part of the Telford 50 celebrations where you've got Bangra dancing and the winner of Telford talent this year performing and the carnival of giants and the Dawley giant, my favourite Dawley giant was yeah. Captain Webb on his bike swimming yeah. his way uh -huh. down to the town park and seeing in excess of 20,000 people spread out between 10 in the morning and 6 in the evening into this park, into a free event you don't get events like that. And I know that people have got fond memories of Kids International. I was there, I was working them. Yeah. But this event was the modern day Kids International. And Kids International was funded by Telford Development Corporation and cost tens of thousands of pounds, of which we haven't got. Yeah. If, if the council spent that kind of money on an event in this day and age, we'd be critical that they weren't spending it on senior citizens or road safety or whatever. They're caught between a rock and a hard place, but actually, that event compared to what it costs compared to Kids International was almost a bigger, better event. And sometimes we look at things a little bit through rose tinted glasses where we remember it with fondness, but actually it was just a couple of big marquees, a couple of beer tents, and the Beacon Radio Roadshow, where I think it was Peter Andre, who'd never had a hit at that point, was yeah. performing, and we were all messing about and prattling about in the town park, which was great. And we have brilliant memories of it and we'll never forget those years from sort of the end of the 80s into the early 90s but i think it's sometimes we lose focus of how good these events are yeah and when these seven eight nine year olds are our age and sharing their memories that oh do you remember telford 50 carnival as they're approaching telford's 100th birthday yeah and whether there'll be that kind of community and involvement of a mixture of Mongol people, whether you were born in Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham or Dawley, yeah. coming together and celebrating what this town has to offer. And it's got loads to offer. I'm, I'm really proud to be part of it and involved in all these different events. And it's a privilege. People say I'll be at the opening of a jar of jam and they're not wrong because yeah. actually it's 
being part, being invited to come along and do stuff, being part of this great town, is something to be really proud of it. And when I'm on the radio, the studios are in Shrewsbury, but almost everything I do is telephone focused because that's so. If I'm talking about, I don't know, having a mishap in the supermarket, that's that mishap's happening in Sainsbury's or as the Donington, it's happening right here, and it's things that we can relate to. And I think living in a town that you're broadcasting is really important because it reflects what you do. You know, if I lived in Sutton Carfield in Birmingham. The things I'm talking about aren't necessarily relevant to the people of Telford, but if we're talking about the works that are going on there, or the new building that's popping on there, or what's going to be in that shop there, or how cool those family are sitting over there having their picnic, then we're part of it. We all know what it's about. We all know what we're talking about. And I think that locality and ownership of an area is really important for the community because I'm proud of it, and I think everybody should be. And you speak to school. Yeah. I went to school when they were um, celebrating the football, they'd all got the waistcoats on and we went to Reek View Primary and the little video of the kids wearing the waistcoats made it on the national one o'clock news and I was like, yes, yeah. this is Telford kids getting behind the England team, making it on the national news every hour on the news channel for six hours because they'd gone to the effort of putting their waistcoats on and supporting Gareth Southgate. Now, okay, we didn't win, but do you know what? All these events are an opportunity for us to get together. They've just announced today that the middle and the millions of pounds are going to be spent on the Anstis, keeping the first effectively working man's club going. And this this battle for funding for that venue has been going on five, six, seven years, maybe yeah. ten, maybe twenty. And actually, the hard work and perseverance of those people that that building is close to have secured its future. And that's community going out. And they've had loads of knockbacks. Yeah. They applied to different funds. And, and I was at one of those funds where they didn't get the funding. And it was devastating for the organisers. But there were so many things. But their perseverance and hard work has resulted in them getting it. So that piece of history will be preserved. The, you know, English, lot, English heritage have spent more money in the Iron Bridge yeah. than any single project on this English planet, you know, yeah. in England, that the biggest investment is sorting out the Iron Bridge and they change it back to its original colour, which is brown. So every artist and photographer that's vlogging pictures yeah. of the Iron Bridge <laughs> will need to get down there and start taking more because yeah. their pictures will be out of date now. But isn't that amazing that English Heritage have spent more money in our town? Than anywhere else in the in the in the country on a single project, more than they've spent in London or Manchester or Birmingham, they spent it in Telford because it's the birthplace of industry. We should yeah. be really proud that we're ticking those boxes to access that kind of money and secure the future and the legacy of those museums and things to see for time to come. Because yeah. it'd be so easy to say, oh well, you know, when the, when the the bridge bows and it broke, we put cones either side and that's the end of it, or we build a new bridge. God, can you imagine? Yeah. But actually, there are people working hard behind the scenes to make sure that what we've got and our historical history can be preserved. But also, facilities like the town park move with the time. They've got the new crazy golf, they've got the water park, they've got the cycle hub. So the stuff for us to do, the stuff that we do, I think you can hire a bike for three quid and cycle around here, there and everywhere, and not even have to have your own bike. I mean, that's a great resource to have. And I think it's ever so easy sometimes to forget what wonderful things that we have here. And yes, we have our fair share of heartache and our fair share of oh, why they're doing that. Or, oh yeah. my God, they're sending the ring road two ways. How are we going to cope? Our heads are going to explode and they're going to move the bus station and things are going to move. But actually, as a town, I think we don't bury our heads in the sand. We do the best that we possibly can to make this an amazing place to live. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, as you said, I mean, they, they do things. People don't realise why they're doing them sometimes. No. It's like the, the new bridge for the um, train station. Yeah. Well, I, four years ago, there was the first cooperative council meeting. Um, and they got people from all elements of the community. They got people that had, that had got community interest groups. They'd got business owners. They got lots of people. And one of the biggest, they had a workshop and they got a, a you know, a flip chart. Yeah. And it was right, what needs to happen? What's wrong with Telford? And one of the biggest things that was brought up by business and the Ironbridge Gorge was one of them that said, our train station's embarrassing. So Ironbridge Gorge said if they got an important visitor coming to the museum, they would get them off the train at Wolverhampton 
and send a car to fetch them because they were embarrassed of the state of Telford Central. They didn't want their first impressions of Telford to yeah. be the old red footbridge and some battered taxis outside. And that was one of the biggest things. So if, if Rico had got an important visitor, they were doing the same thing. Yeah. They were limoing them from Wolverhampton. And Wolverhampton's not a pretty station. Or from Shrewsbury, because they were embarrassed by what the station had yeah. to offer. And the point was that if this is a gateway to people visiting Telford, whether it's coming to the International Centre or coming for a day out or just coming for a day out in the town, people drive 40 miles to come and play in this park that a lot of us can walk to because yeah. it is better than the Arboretum at Warsaw. It's better than Sutton Park, which is where I grew up, and it's, it hurts me to say that, yeah. but it's true. This place is better. You know, yes, it's big. Yes, it's got lots of bushes, but it's got nothing like the floral tributes and the decoration and the well-kept grass and the, and the crazy golf and the things to do and the, the gardens that Telford has got. So th th what business was saying was, we need a good positive gateway. And it took nearly 10 years to get the funding in place to do that. But it is important, our first impressions, if we went to Coventry and that was what you were greeted with, there's not much cop here, and you haven't even got into all the good things. Yeah. So having a positive gateway a practical approach so wheelchairs could get from one side to the other and something that didn't look like it was made in Meccano and painted red 50 years ago which is yeah. not far off where it was goes great strides because you can look at that and think oh that looks pretty cool and yes it's a lot of money but that money was accessed from different funds and whether you believe in Europe or not, some of that money came yeah. from there. So let's invest it. Let's make the place look good. Let's have important visitors to the Iron Bridge dropped off at Telford Central. Let's look at how much that station has to offer. And let's be proud that our friends and relatives can get off there and we're not embarrassed by the state of the surroundings. And it was pretty dire. Yeah. It needed doing. And and, yes, it's very dis um, disabled friendly as well, isn't it? Because um, the new, access with the new yeah. lifts and everything. And, and don't get me wrong. I very rarely use the trains, and, and I suppose a lot of people that would kick off about the amount of money spending would not use the trains. But would you be <coughs> embarrassed if a multi-million pound investor, Theo Pathetis was here about three weeks ago, yeah. um, judging the Young Entrepreneur competition that was in the International Centre, which was schools from across the country getting together, and Telford 50 co-sponsored it, and it's the first time they've come to the same venue twice. They came here last year as just part of their rotation around the country, and Telford 50 encouraged them to come back. And Theo Pathetis was there, the winner of the, um, the Apprentice was there, yeah. inspirational to these young kids that were coming up with business ideas. And you're proud to say to them, yes, we've got all this new investment, we've, we're investing in the future, we're putting jobs here, whether those jobs are in restaurants and hospitality, because at the moment retail's not making any money. Yeah. All the big retailers are going, so we've got to have jobs in hospitality and hotels and restaurants and people visiting, or we'll have no jobs at all because manufacturing is taking the turf. You can debate that all night, but the reality is that coal and manufacturing things that were the staple of, of the country in the 60s and the 70s has moved on and if you don't move with the times you just end up getting very bitter sitting in your chair and being very miserable that it wasn't how it was in the, in the past let's look at what we're going to get in the future and I think that is something that Telford as a town is doing quite well you know shoot me down because it's not historical and sentimental but actually if businesses close then Saturday jobs and future jobs for our kids and grandkids go as well. So let's invest in a sector where there's money. And if there's money in restaurants, be it chain restaurants or, or high finance dining or cheap takeaways, if that's where the jobs are, let's have them because we need employment for everybody in this town for it to, pop, it to thrive. So I'm not that bothered if future generations are working in the trade as long as they're working and paying their tax in to help me in my old age. Cause that's the reality isn't it yeah so do you think the um what they do in south water now with the with, with the sort of restaurants cafes this type of thing is um is what they is what sort of taken over what used to be like entertainment sort of like um like nightclubs and things like that the reality is people don't go to nightclubs yeah because when we went to nightclubs we went because we were single it was the only place you could meet single people yeah whether you like it or not now if you're single and you want to meet somebody you go on an app 
and you you chat to them online yeah. you don't have to go to a pub or a club to meet other single-minded people yeah therefore you don't so now when you know in 1996 I was DJing on a Friday night in Cascades it was full and most of the people in there were single looking to mingle that's yeah. why they were there there was a few people out with the mates but most of them were on the lookout yeah nowadays those people are on the lookout on their dating apps or, or, or tinder or whatever they're using to meet people yeah therefore the only people that go into pubs and clubs are social drinkers or people that um, maybe are looking for, to celebrate a birthday or go for a night out or go for a nostalgia night or whatever but the reality is the number of people going to the venues there aren't many of them so we've only got one one and a half two venues that are catering for people and those venues are struggling because there's not that many people going out there's a few out on a Saturday night and a few out on a Friday night and that's about it but actually when you look at the trends in the big cities, the cities that had 10 nightclubs have now got two. So if we had three and we still got one, we're not doing too badly. Yeah. But as individuals, when we were kids, we were going out three nights a week to meet someone. Well now, they might go out once a month. And we might go out once a year for a Christmas party or a birthday. But that's the only time we're going to go out for loud music. We might go out to eat yeah. twice a week. So th things move on. And therefore, the economy's got to move on. Because actually, if you put a Motown night on, people that are into Motown now are 60, 65, 70 years old because of where they fit. I'm 45 and I'm into the late 80s, early 90s. So 90s nights are the 60s and 70s nights from when we were kids. And if that doesn't move on, then it's not sustainable because how many 65 year olds are going to go out till three in the morning? Yeah. We might go out till 11, yeah. we might go out till half 11. We might even stay out till midnight. Yeah. We didn't stay until three in the morning. And there ain't going to be a thousand of us like there was in Cascades in 1994. Yeah. So when they have successful reunions, there's 300 people. They go, oh, it's dead. There used to be thousands of us. But yeah. that's because thousands of us went out. Thousands of us were single and desperate yeah. to find somebody. <laughs> and now that's not how you find people. That's not the, the, the single people honeypot that it was back in the day. So because those things have moved on and they're different, the venues are going to move on and be different, otherwise they close. And that's why you're seeing pubs and nightclubs close, because we as the public don't go to them. And if we don't go to them, they ain't going to survive. And, you know, back in the day, we went three times a week. It was a very different town, a very different society, a very different planet back then. Yeah, talk, I talked about that because um, the, the Anstice down there, I don't know if you know, but um, they had them like Soul Nights down yep. there. Um, Aid Shaw, I think, is uh, the guy that did, did them. Um, and, and those kind of events do really well. Really well, yeah. But they have to be occasional, so no more than once every couple of months. Yeah. And they might get a few hundred people, which in a venue like that is busy. Yeah. Right? But Motown nights in the late 70s would get 1,500 people. Yeah. No problem at all. You know, the townhouse would be full in Wellington, Cascades would be full, Rumours would be full, Quenches would be full, yeah. um, Sawyers would be full. So there'd be 4,000 people out spread over those venues. That has reduced from 4,000 to 200 to yeah. give you one good night every six weeks. Whereas there were four venues doing four good nights every single week. Yeah. Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and then bank holiday Sundays. I can remember going to the film exchange next to the cinema on a bank holiday Monday night yeah. and not being able to get to the bar. It was rammed because they were doing karaoke. The new thing had just arrived. But that's because everybody went out. Now, at home, you've got better films on your telly than they've got at the cinema. You've got a bigger screen, you've got yeah. a comfy sofa, you've got all the beer you can drink for half the price in the fridge. So now, socialising is something you do at home and you talk to your friends on Facebook because that's how we've evolved. And hate it or love it, yeah. that's the reality of how things move on. If we don't embrace it and move on with it, it falls to bits. You're watching this on Facebook now, sitting at home, yeah. because we'd be having this conversation in the pub 30 years ago. Yeah. And you, at least you could tell me where rubbish it was. But the, the point is, we've evolved now to sitting in the town park talking to a mobile phone. Yeah. Because that's how culturally we've evolved. And if you were writing an article for a newspaper, less people would read it than we'll see this video. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. What's, what's your memories of um, Cascades then? Well, Cascades is a really weird one. Um, I started working there when it was branded The New Cascades in 94. And it was run by a guy called Nigel. A little short blonde guy. Um, Mark Trant will be watching this. He was the bar manager at the time. He'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Dave was the assistant manager. 
and I was DJing at the ice rink on a Friday night. And he came over to me and came into the ice rink and came up to me and said, have you ever thought about DJing in a nightclub? And my answer was no. Never thought about it. My, I wanted to be a radio DJ and the ice rink sessions were geared like a radio. So there'd be jingles and there'd be, it'd be like a r live radio show. That's how they were, were pitched because that's what I wanted to do. So that was a way of expressing myself and finding my radio voice and radio stations finding me, which is actually what happened in the end. Yeah. Although it wasn't probably that well orchestrated at the time because it started off with me playing records in my bedroom, reading out the charts out of the paper on a Monday night and talking to myself in my bedroom like so many of us do yeah but I think that kind of looking back was the crook of me deciding that actually this is something I want to do and I had a day job as a hairdresser as I mentioned earlier for years while I was DJing up at the icing on a Friday night and this Nigel said oh, come and do it I said well I've never done it before I can't do that mixing stuff because that mixing stuff is pretty hard we were on vinyl back in these days yeah. with a couple of CDs to scatter them out and he went it's all right I've got a really good job go play the music for you I thought, what, what do you want me for? He said, well, he doesn't talk on the mic. We want a bit of banter, as it was, which was usually me insulting people in white socks, if, if we're honest. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realise how switched on he was, because I was pretty naive. So I turned up. Suddenly they were paying me three times more than I was getting in the ice rink. And I was going after the ice rink, so I was still doing the ice rink, and then going across the road and, and playing in Cascades. And, of course, time went on. So a year later... The 17 year olds that were listening to me in the ice rink are now all in the nightclub. And three years later, the 15 year olds are all in there. So, what he was doing was cementing the following that I'd built up in the ice rink and giving a natural progression into Cascades rather than going to Wellington to Rumours or to 42s in Open Gates. So, what he was doing was channeling those young people into wanting to go to his venue because I was there and I'd got association familiarity because I've never been a, a great DJ but I've always had a bit of a personality and a bit of a following that went with it and he was just cashing in on that and, and I spent three or four years there and I ended up working at Maxim's in Stoke as well because his assistant manager was also the manager up at Maxim's and they were like oh come and do some stuff for us we like what you're doing and it just kind of fitted for those venues and then when I finished there the guy from 42nd Street, which was Eric, came and said, oh, come and work for me. And I spent eight years at 42s doing exactly the same thing. And 42s was an older nightclub than Cascades. Yeah. So six years passed at Cascades. So now they're all in their late 20s. So suddenly I go to 42s and sure enough, that happened then. Then I went to Beacon, which was a 24 to 40 radio station and they pretty much listened to me there yeah. and then I went to Telford FM which was targeted at 30 to 50 and they went there and now I'm at the BBC which is targeted at 50 to 70 year old and some of them are still there yeah. God bless them and there was a, somebody I spoke to when was it now um, I was at a school disco and this woman came up to me Porky Pig I was Porky Pig for two years here at the ice rink and she'd remembered that and whenever she heard me on the radio she'd say to her kid oh that Porky Pig off the radio and you don't realise that how, if you happen to be entertaining somebody in their formative years, between about 13 and 19, that you become one of those memories for life because yeah. you're part of that map of those brilliant times, that brilliant music of that growing up. And I didn't think 90s music was great at the time, but for those people, your Ace of Bass and your Dream were massive songs. But for me, those songs were... 88, 90, because they were my formative years. Yeah. And as people move on, whatever songs you listen to between 13 and 17 are always going to be what you think are the best decade of music. And you can argue with your parents till you're blue in the face that 70s is better than Motown, which is yeah. better than 80s, which is better than 90s. It depends where your formative years are. And that's how that all started. And that led pretty much to what I'm doing today. Because now I'm over 40, 45 now, yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the audience I'm broadcasting to are the parents and the grandparents of the kids of today, but our memories track all the way through. And it's one of those things that that happens with lots of people in lots of industries. It happens with telly. You know, our favorite personalities in telly are probably the people we watched on kids TV back in the day, whether that was Philip Schofield in the broom cupboard. Well, to our kids and grandkids, it's just the bloke off this morning. Yeah. And we're all watching this morning because we grew up with him 
at that point in that timeline yeah and he became part of our formative years and you might be a, a philip schofield or an andy crane or an andy peters or a toby anstis but whoever was presenting children's tv when you were on it you'll always have a soft spot for whether it be edward duck or gordon the go for or whatever yeah or it, and i was talking i did an interview with um, lee mcdonald who was zamo in grange hill he's yeah. 50. zamo off grange hill he's 50. <laughs> right boom yeah. That's how, and we were saying exactly the same thing about Grange Hill. If if you are now in your mid fifties, yeah. Tucker was your character. If you're in your mid forties, it's Gonch and Zamo yeah. and Gripper Stepson. Yeah. And if you're a bit younger, it's Toby Maguire and people like that. Um, but Grange Hill was one of those programs that was always on, and we connected with the kids that were either our age or a little bit younger than us because yeah. we were afraid of the older ones because they were the bullies. They were the ones nicking our pocket money or flushing yeah. our heads down the loop. And we watched that programme and we were horrified about going to senior school because we were in junior school that that was going to happen to us. And then it was never that bad, but it kind of was. Yeah. It, it kind of was a good representation, but as a, a primary school kid, you were always afraid of it. And, and that's another great example of music and culture, how it moves with the times and therefore... I'm doing a gig in December with Martin Kemp. Now, I did a gig in Cascade, no, Athena, yeah. with Martin Kemp in the early 2000s. It was rammed. There were people, and the age of the people, the sort of Spandau Valley, so they were sort of my mums to my generation. Yeah. And I'm suspecting at the Buckley Market in December, they will be the same people, but they'll be 20 years older. And Martin Kemp's playing an 80s set. And, you know, he makes you sick because he's looking better now yeah. <laughs> than he did in the 80s. Yeah. And we're all looking a bit more haggard and a bit more wrinkled and a bit more, not half as slick as him as a silver fox is looking. Yeah. But those people that go to see him, it'll be a sellout, you're guaranteed. And there'll be people there that remember seeing him at Athena. And there'll be people that there that remember him from Spandau Ballet. And there were generations that go, who? Yeah. Because they'll be too young to connect with him. Yeah. But they'll connect him with his son because his son, Roman Kemp, is now yeah. the Capital Breakfast presenter and doing um, X Factor backstage and stuff like that. So they'll be connecting with his son, which makes us feel even older. But it's yeah. one of the realities of how things map through time, whether it be music, culture, areas, things have to move. If they don't move, you just end up getting miserable and cranky about the things that facts, things aren't what they used to be. You know, well loaf of bread doesn't cost what it used to yeah. and red sweets haven't got lead in them to colour them which they did have in the 1800s yeah. when you go down and actually that might be a good thing and you know banning weed killers and stuff like that maybe there's a good environmental impact like that but maybe it's inconvenient that our plants have got black fire on yeah it, it's it's evolution isn't it and and for me it's got to be about moving with the times and getting on board that bus because otherwise, you just left in the cold wait for the next one. What do you think about um, what they're talking about in Ironbridge, talking about bringing some sort of train sort of back down to that area? Yeah, the Telford Steam Railway, which is at Horsehay, the road, the railway links right the way down to Ironbridge, and the chair of the railway, which is Paul Hughes, wants the steam railway to go right the way back there. There are two potential problems. One is the railway line crosses a road, now, with the, you know, in Shrewsbury they're trying to get rid of level crossings at the moment because sometimes people choose to end their lives on there, yeah. which is, is a real issue because actually if somebody wants to, they're going to do that. Um, so taking crossings about accidents need avoiding, but if somebody wants to do it, they will, and, and that's always going to be a problem. But having a railway line cross a road is one of the things that the highways agency want less than anything else. Yeah. And if you can't do that, you've got a big problem because actually it's pretty close to the railway now and it's not close to Ironbridge end so you've got to get across that road before you can get any further yeah um, now they're hopefully have secured some funding and it'd be great to make it happen and have that steam railway running much further than it does because it's second fiddle to Bridge North because of the length of track it's traveling yeah. between Bridge North and Kidderminster now traveling between Telford and Ironbridge would be a great thing for sightseeing and tourist attractions but it would have a lot of challenges in terms of getting the track there, having the engines that are capable of going up and down hills because it's not a flat incline like most railway lines are because if you look at the height above the sea of Ironbridge compared to Dorley, yeah. it's massive. So there's lots of things to be encountered. It'd be great for tourism, but it'll be a big project and it'll face a lot of challenges 
before it comes off. Will it come off in my lifetime? I hope so, but I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't. Yeah, they seem to be at the, the local MPs are starting to sort of get behind it now, as yeah. well, don't they? Yeah. And, and if everyone can get behind it, great. And if somebody chips up the money and pay for it, even be better. better yeah. But it's a big undertaking. It's not lay a bit of track there or brush off the track and start running trains down there. That yeah. road is the biggest issue. And how good that bridge is um, when you come down from Dorley, come off Livian's Island, take a right, go down, go under the railway bridge. Yeah. Is that Will that bridge still support trains? I don't know. Yeah. So structurally things, there's a lot of challenges and then it carries on and then goes across the road. So how achievable is it? I'd like to think it would happen and, and they'll be much more equipped to tell you and it'd be great, but it ain't going to happen overnight. No. Yeah, so it's funding that they need. I mean, yeah. they did it with money the Money and manpower, yeah. because they're all volunteers down there. There's yeah. no paid staff at Thomas Steam Railway at all. And they haven't got the level of investment and investors yeah. that the Seven Valley have got because of the history and, and the, the world-renowned established that is as a steam railway, whereas Telford is a very small, a little cousin compared to a lot of the small yeah. steam railways dotted around the country. And to become a big player, fair play to Paul, the investment of the Polar Express is a massive thing for them because it, it generates tens of thousands of pounds every Christmas. And getting that deal has stimulated investment. And I think steam them on, excuse the pun, in terms of getting funding and having that aim to go for and then be able to apply for match funding because they're able to generate that money. But it's so much money. And if they can achieve it, then it's about manpower, it's about everything that goes with such a... That's a massive project for a borough council, let alone for a bunch of volunteers in Horsay. And I, I wish them the best. I hope it comes off. But it's a big physical challenge, both from a resource and a manpower point of view. But it'd be great to have one. Yeah, I think the people behind the Iron Bridge, they, they were quite shocked by the money that they were able to raise through the yeah. fundraising page. Yep. They didn't they think they expected quite think, the amount. I think people are more inclined to now click and make a donation on Just Giving than maybe put a couple of quid in a, in a box next to the till, because nobody has cash anymore. No. So you don't have change to put in the box there. But when you're looking through an appeal on Facebook or whatever, it's quite easy to click and commit to how much you can do. You've only got to look at how donations are made to big events like children in need. Now, everybody now is doing it with a text or doing it with a just giving click rather than ringing up and pledging their money or collecting money in a bucket and taking it to the building society. The, the way we handle money has changed. Yeah. And there was a thing I read on Facebook today about the Edinburgh Festival. They're setting up so you can donate to street entertainment with your card. So they're doing, you know, one pound, do it contactless, whatever, because the street entertainers are aware that they're getting less and less money because people no, don't appreciate the thing. They haven't got any cash in their pocket. They haven't yeah. got any pash, cash to chuck in the hat. You haven't got, so they're setting it up with them pay contactless. It's just the way we're going. Yeah, I did see that um, for the buskers and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I've probably got £12 in my pocket yeah. and I'm going to play ice hockey tonight and that's a tenner. So I've got two quid floating. How much pocket cash you got in your pocket? Um, I've probably got a tenner. <laughs> right. so, so we've got a bit, yeah. but there'll be lots of people. That if I ask you now how much cash in your pocket, lots yeah. of people go, I ain't got any. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, when you forget your wallet, if you've got your phone and your cards on it, don't need it. But then, everybody that wants that little bit of change or whatever has got to go down the same route, otherwise the charities are going to miss out on the loose change because there isn't any, because we're paying digitally. So then we have to donate digitally. And, and again, that's another sign of the times. And, you know, fight it, get left behind, but it's a reality, I think. What do you think about the, um, the, the, sort of the local groups in the area um, that we've got? Because we've got quite a bit of talent coming up. Um, in oh, Calpers. you mean musically? Yeah. Uh, phenomenal. Phenomenal. When you look at what Savannah and loads of acts on BBC Introducing are putting forward, um, the, the genre... When, when I realised they were doing a two-hour programme a week, and I used to do an hour a week when I was on Telford of local unsigned acts, and... You, when you start out, you think, oh God, you know, that we're looking at 22 songs every week. That's a big ask for local music, musicians, but fair play to them. They are coming up with some great events. I'm doing, um, presenting the Prosecco and Proms in the Park in Newport, which has got classical musicians, but they're coming out of school. They're school kids that are born and bred in Telford, expressing themselves musically. And some of the talent that is coming out there is phenomenal. And as a county, I think Shropshire-wide is incredibly rich with great acts. 
and, and Telford's no second cousin to that. Bishop's Castle's doing really well, Telford's doing really well, Parts of Shrewsbury are doing really well. Everywhere has got somebody that's got a talent and actually presented <coughs> Telford's got talent for four years in the early noughties. They brought it back this year for the Telford 50. And the, the top three artists of the very first Telford talent, Dan Crossley, who won it, is now in London with a record contract. Lewis Coop is working with Dan Owen doing um, cruise ships, music entertaining. He's in his second band. He's making videos and, and touring and playing cruise ships. He came second. Uh, he came third. Uh, one of the second place acts. He's still performing. I think she's gone into musical theatre. And that was the very first one. And every single time we do this, we think, oh, well, will we be scraping the barrel? And every single year, people come up trumps with amazing singers and performers and you get to see some really great acts up and down the county and you know Telford's no second fiddle to that they've got some great musicians that are performing and 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 working hard to to make their way I mean Lewis was a great example he appeared on The Voice a couple of years ago as well and Tom Jones turned around for him and had some good things to say yeah. about him and it, there are some fantastic talent and I think Telford's not a bad place for nurturing it. Yes, there are much fewer live music venues, but that's because the same reason we spoke about earlier, less people going out, that the venues can't support and pay the artists to do it for six people being in the venue. So if we want more live music venues, we've got to go to them. It's not yeah. it's no good banging the drum and saying we need them. It's when they put an, a live music evening or a open night, we've got to go and support that event so that the landlord makes a couple of quid because if they don't, it won't carry on. You've got to support whatever you want to keep going. So don't bang on that it should happen. When it happens, support it so they do it more. And if you don't support it, don't expect it to stick around. Well, behind you, I mean, you've got the um, the international centre yep. behind you. Um, do you think Telford could do with something bigger, sort of, um, to bring in some of the bigger acts? I don't know, because the issue that I have is with venues, Theatre Seven's got six hundred capacity. Uh, the Place Theatre is just under 600 in terms of its capacity. Yeah. They're putting a lot of events on for the big top over Telford 50. And those two towns are very close together. So if there's an act on that you want to see and it appears in Tel uh, Shrewsbury, you'll go. Uh, if there's an act on in Telford you want to see and you live in Shrewsbury, you'll probably go. So there's two 600 venues that are supported. That will hold bigger, but the reality is will they sell out when they've got the big top and they're looking for 800? Yeah. Because of the size of the town. Look, we have a town which has between 170 and 200,000 people. Shrewsbury's 160 to 180,000 people. Yeah. We're overtaking it, right? I get that. But we are 45 minutes drive from Birmingham. We are an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes drive from Manchester. We are hour and five, hour and 10 from Liverpool. We are 15 minutes from Shrewsbury. We are 30 minutes from Wolverhampton. And actually, having a big venue creates a big logistical problem because the break-even point might be on a 1500 venue. The break-even point is a thousand people. Well, if you're not, unless you're selling out the 600 venues, and we get some big names, you get Jimmy Carr and Russell Brand playing Open Gates. Yeah. Therefore, they're playing that kind of venue because they're guaranteed to sell it out. Are they not playing the big arenas because they're not going to sell it out? Or are they doing warm-up material ready for those big arenas? Would we sustain one? Because then our competitors would become Coventry, Birmingham, Wolverhampton. And Birmingham has a, a population of 2.65 million. Yeah. So if there's 2.65 million and 5% are going to go to an event, you've got a few thousand. If there's 200,000 and 5% are going, we've got less than a couple of hundred. So will our town with its current population support an artist that would probably choose the bigger towns to go to. I'm not sure it would, and that's yeah. probably why we haven't got one. Because, you know, the Ice Rick hosted status quo a couple of times. Yeah. There's been a couple of big artists perform at the International Centre, but there's not that much of a pull because it's so much easier for them to go to Birmingham or London. Yeah. And we go with them. So, you know, and when they do have artists, you know, when we had Boyzone in the town, there was a lot of criticism because the council didn't make any money. Yeah. And they were close to breaking even, but you need, you know, hundreds. And the 80s gig in the quarry got hundreds of thousands of people turn up and pay their 50 quid a head. But a lot of people moaned about the price. Yeah. But because that's worked in, in Shrewsbury and the quarry, because of the angle of it, lends itself that wherever you sit, you can see the stage. Yeah. The bowl here is flat. So you've either got to build the stage really high yeah. or 
people are, aren't, aren't going to be able to see. So you, you have to sort of sit around the side. So is it as good a venue? Maybe, and this big top might be a good test to see how much demand there is, but you can see by how much they're promoting what they've got yeah. that they're desperate to fill those venues out. And if they don't fill it out when it's looking for 800 or whatever, then you haven't got a demand for a 1,000 seater theatre. And when Shrewsbury built the seven theatre, they built a 600 seater, which I think speaks volumes of what Shropshire will command, yeah. which is the same size as Open Gates. Yes, with a bigger, higher stage, but in terms of what it's going, capable of, they could have very easily built a thousand seater, but they chose not to, probably because of the overheads and the fact that once you get above a certain size, there's a lot more risk for acts and promoters to take stuff there. And would you be rather be busy and have four nights a week for acts on in a six hundred seater than two nights a week in a thousand seater? Yeah. That's what you you're up against in some respects. And outdoor events are great, but if the weather's crap you lose a lot of money. Yeah. And that's a massive risk. You know, this summer it hasn't been a risk. Every Saturday the sun shot. When's the last time that happened? The two years before it rained every Saturday that I can remember. And you know, if it's your money and you're out of your pocket and it's thirty, fifty grand, I certainly couldn't afford to I couldn't even afford to mortgage a house and risk it. Yeah. And then if it's a bad day, people don't go. Just wow. And that's why I think we don't have it. I mean, whether that will stay, whether that will turn round, whether that will change as the population gets bigger, but we are a town and therefore we have facilities the size of a town. When I first started working here, we had minibuses everywhere because there weren't enough people to fill a single decker. Now we have single deckers, but where I grew up, everywhere was double decker and they came yeah. every four minutes because there were lots of people getting on them. Until those single deckers are full, you ain't going to get double deckers. So that's going to apply to theatres, that's going to apply to hotels, that's going to apply to leisure, that's going to apply to nightclubs. You know, our nightclub capacity is 1,500 and they're lucky to get 400 people. You go to Birmingham, they've got clubs getting 1,000 people, but the capacity of them is 4,000 people and they're still only getting 1,000. So it's got to be linked to population because otherwise if the venues get too big, they're set to fail. And and you look at the big retailers at the moment, you look at House of Fraser, that they're pulling out of Wolverhampton, let alone Telford. Yeah. So people aren't spending the money in them, and if you don't use it, you lose it. That's how economics works. Yeah, because a lot of people buy online now, don't they? Sort of, um, yeah. it's easy what, to what, do. Or, or, or retail parks or off-site. Yeah. You see, everybody sits there and criticises it, and then you buy your stuff online. I do, so I can't be critical of anybody else from doing yeah. it, because... I can buy things online cheaper than the shops because I can buy it from the same place. You know, when we were, grew up in the 80s, if you wanted to get something, you had to go to a shop that sold it because they had the link to the wholesalers. Now, we can buy from the same people the shop are buying from. So why would you pay retail when yeah. you can get it for cost price? Because the wholesalers sell it online as well. And probably so do the manufacturers in China. So if you're prepared to wait six weeks, you get it for a quarter of the price. Well, how can, shops can't compete with that. No. And yes, you may support them and you go down and get them, but hang on, if you go down to a farm shop and your lettuce is four times the cost of what it is at Aldi, it's a big decision to make if you haven't got much money in your pocket. Yeah, I think that's why I think Tesco's are joining with Carrefour's, aren't they, to um, bring out their own sort of... The, 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 basically, everybody's uniting because it, it, it's get together or, or sink. Yeah. You know, and Tesco's was the biggest player 10 years ago. Yeah. Tesco's had a really tough, tough ride of it. And, you know, Aldi and Lidl, which are supermarkets we all used to take the mick out of back in the day, and now we're visiting once every 10 days, and we might go to Asda or Sainsbury's or Waitrose, depending on your nature, between times. Yeah. But for your staple stuff, for your brand name stuff, why not if you're going to save some money? Because we haven't got money in our pockets to spend £10 on something if we can get it for 5 And that's the issue with the economy as I see it now all this everything that I'm saying is my opinion there's, yeah it's not necessarily tried and tested but that's how I see it evolving or being the reason it is what it is that's like um Primark as well because Primark used to sort of people used to look down at Primark but now lots of yeah. people use it now because it's yeah. good, and good, then good get, stuff you get the debates of ethical clothing manufacturers and um, yeah but then ethical coffee and ethical clothes and ethical co 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 cost more money now, if you can afford to support that, and that's important to you, then you can choose to buy those things. But for some people on the poverty line, where the choice is, do I have a tin of beans, a t-shirt, and a pair of pumps? Yeah. Or do I have ethically sourced coffee and none of the others? 
Or if you've got kids to feed, you can't criticise people for doing that. You can only live to the means of the amount of money in your pocket. And, you know, if you've got it and you're happy to spend it, then great. But if you haven't got it, you can't bully people into being ethical if they can't afford to provide for their family. Yeah. So, um, with Talford as well, what, what was here when you came? What, what was... Um, right, the ice rink, which is there, was here. Next to it where the bowling alley was, was just a field. We used to play football in there. The meeting point house was there, and then you had Spencer's in the shopping centre. So the bowling alley wasn't even there. That was built after I was there for about 10 years, um, and we lost our football pitch. We were devastated. And of course, you had the pond with the pedalos and everything that we associated with Spout Farm House. When that was built, it was maintained by the ice rinks, and the cafe staff would also run Spout Farm House. They had the decking on, and, and, and that was the sort of hub of the town centre. That was the control room of the town park. And of course that went and then the new facilities were built and then the total overhaul of the town park. There were some beautiful gardens in, I think, was it Rico that sponsored the Chinese garden? Or so. wherever it was. Yeah. Um, and the bowl has always been there, but we didn't have any of the pond. Well, we had the ponds, but we didn't have the water feature. There were just ponds and pedlows and the, and the climbing frames. And it was very raw, the town centre, in terms of... You know, I can remember them putting CCTV in for helping with lost children and stuff that went like that. And of course, a, a child tragically drowned in one of the lakes, so then they fenced the lakes off, and, and that changed the way they thought about the depths and how, you know, things were going to go for the future. And and those slides were great fun, but were pretty dangerous. We'd go shooting yeah. off, you know, uh -huh. putting washing up liquid on them and come shooting off the bottom, and you know, the, the pranks that kids got up to. You can kind of see why those things aren't around anymore. And, and yes, we had fun, and yes, it toughened us up. But yes, we did break a few few bones as well, and you know, yeah. a few tears were shed. But we, I suppose that goes with the territory. But nowadays, if somebody's going to sue somebody for something not being safe, then everything's got to be safe, hasn't it? Yeah. So what what was, what was the supermarket when you come here? Which one was it? Uh, Sainsbury's was where you know where the petrol station is now yeah it was parallel to the end of the petrol station so sainsbury's was prob the back of sainsbury's where tk max was and the car park was in front of it so the forge retail park hadn't been built um so sainsbury's was there uh retail the reeking retail park had opened so tesco's had opened and there was a big hoo-ha because tesco's wanted an on and an off on the retail park and the uh, planning permission would only allow them an on and an off on the same road, which is why we all whinge now that yeah. it's gridlocked, because they didn't want it to be used as a cut through, yeah. as a shortcut. Um, so Reekin Retail Park had just opened, Sainsbury's Retail wasn't open, as the Donington hadn't been built. Um, what else? I grew up in Dorley, and the high street was open to vehicles, then they shut it and pedestrianised it, then they reopened it again. So that went through three phases while I was living in Dorley. The house I'm in now is in Red Lake, which wasn't built when I first moved here. That I bought that from you, moved there about 2004. Um, and of course, from the M54 to Dorley was fields with sheep in it. And the, um, there was a model air group, and they used to fly their model aeroplanes off that field, where, opposite the Mormons church, which wasn't there either. Yeah. That field there, they had they, they mowed an airstrip and they used to fly model aeroplanes off there. Now, there's a few thousand houses from there down to what was, um, it's Lawley, isn't it? Lawley yeah. Village. So yeah, all of that wasn't there. The traffic lights at Lawley Village were still a traffic island. So you'd go up there, I spun my van around there and once, took it a bit fast as you should, huh. as you shouldn't. Um, yeah, and probably the most iconic bit was the, the mine shaft that's still on the end of the Eastern Primary, because I lived in Dorley, so that was me. Oh, you're home now, you just got to go up Finger Road and you're, you're back home. And that's still there, and if they ever move that, that'll be, that'll be my sentimental bit. Yeah. But it's changed a lot, and as I say, I feel like I've only been here five minutes, but now it's uh, 25, 10. It's, where does the time go? Yeah. It just flies, and little things change. And suddenly somebody will go, oh, I remember the Model Air, the moan track where they used to fly the planes off. Or, you know, as I say, a lot of me and my mates used to play football between the sessions on the ice rink on the field, which is now the bowling alley. And that feels like it's been there forever. And that's one of the older pieces of that development. Because, of course, Spencer's Mall, we all went there. But then we stopped going there and we favoured shops. And sure enough, it, it went. And, and whether it was engineered that it went or not, whatever. But when you think, 
focus do it all that was just over yeah. there so if you if you do some maintenance the ice rink you do some paint you got an order number and you went to do it all mal house so that was head office for the ice rink so you go over to melonsley house if you need to see head of leisure or whatever of course the council house is gone now and that's asda and then asda's gone and that's yeah. middle and and before that it was sainsbury's and then sainsbury's went off site so there's been massive development and, and changes most of which i think are for the better but the sentimental might argue with me yeah I thought they would do. <laughs> um, did you ever, I don't know if you ever saw the um, the new the film that was actually made up here. I think it's about yeah, 90. The guy off um, Duty Free was in it, wasn't yeah. he? And they used the frontage of Rico. And actually, that area behind us, yeah. was he had a bit of a rendezvous with the lady and, and the actor, and there were bits that were shot in the town park. Now, I, can, I remember seeing that, and I wasn't up here and then it was repeated again when I did live in Telford and he said oh it's the front of Rico yeah and yeah, and yeah, yeah I, I do remember it oddly yeah there's been yeah there's been a lot of people coming a lot of um, this sort of I think the Doctor Who in Blistel and um, I think the strongest man in Britain was done in Blistel yeah they did um They've done a lot of the the uh, Master Chef and things like that. They've, they've done down at Bliss Hill as well. But it's a, it's the same with the Black Country Museum. Anything historical, it's perfect yeah. because of the setting. So if you want to set something historical, there are no satellite dishes on any of the buildings. Uh, there are no pylons in any of the shop. For telly, that's a big problem. So if you're setting if you're setting a drama in the Yorkshire Dales and there's pylons and satellite dishes on every house, you're kind of screwed. So you need something that's true to history. So like enclosed states now if you look at Bliss Hill Museum the Black Country Museum and a set of Coronation Street they're very very similar in the terms of the way they're enclosed and the way they're controlled so that they can control the conditions to set it to the time that it is and Coronation Street had to move to Media City because the Hilton Hotel in Manchester was built and suddenly was in the back of shop and it's like right ah. yeah <laughs> so now you can see we're in the centre of Manchester and Granada telly went didn't it of course yeah. and, and the iconic and again it's progress it's time you know so many people get sentimental about Pebble Mill I used to do a lot of work there and I miss it like crazy yeah but it was the asbestos filled large building and it's great to look at pictures and nostalgia and Juliet Bravo was made there and loads of great dramas and uh, telly addicts with Noel Edmonds and, and big part of my childhood Pebble Mill at one which was awful but part of our childhood and when those things move on it's great to get nostalgic but I wouldn't want to be working in there. I'd much rather be working at Radio Shropshire or in the mailbox or in Salford because the facilities are up to date. So um, where was you living when you... Because you were in um, Come Dime with me, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, where I am now. Uh, yeah. That was shot seven years ago. It's repeated on average about every six months. And somebody always sees it for the first time and messages me on Facebook or Twitter or social networking mm. and says, oh, I've just seen it on telly and I think oh, it's repeated again. And if it repeats on something like More 4, you get a few. If it repeat one day, they repeated it on Channel 4, Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock, and social networking just went berserk. <laughs> um, that was just done for a bit of fun. And as I say, seven years ago, and they repeated about every six months, and somebody always discovers it. I mean, I've lost a few pounds since it was on, so hopefully yeah. they'd recognise that it was set a while back. But it was quite good fun to do. Long days, but quite yeah. good fun. So it was all the people in it, they were all from sort of this area? Yeah, or... um, Josh, who I used to coach at ice hockey. So you know when you go snooping around the house, yeah. there was no shots of Josh's bedroom because there's a picture of his ice hockey team on it and I was on it. So yeah. they couldn't use it because they don't like you to know each other. They, don't, they yeah. don't want you to pretend you don't know each other, but they don't want you to make a thing of it. Yeah. So you just kind of neutralise it, if you like. Um, Penny was from Shrewsbury. Uh, Richard, the lighting salesman, was from Shrewsbury. Uh, as was the girl that won it. She went and moved out to New Zealand. Uh, the rest of us are still in touch via Facebook and, and Josh and I still frequent the ice rink on a regular basis. Uh, so you had to go for meals up, up, up in Shrewsbury? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think there's one in Pontsbury, one in Shrewsbury, the two in Shrewsbury Town Centre, then Josh in Trench and me in Red Lake. Was it Shrewsbury or Shrewsbury? Uh, Shrewsbury for <laughs> me. Um, most of the people that say Shrewsbury um, also say grass and garage and because um so i think it's a dialect thing rather than thing but if in doubt say shropshire or yeah. the county town <laughs> avoid it. when we were on beacon we used to say shrewsbury in the opening of the link and shrewsbury in the close of the link you used to say it both ways so you, the, the idea was that you appeased everybody but i think you just annoyed everybody by doing that but uh, yeah that's how we used to get around it when we had beacon started it was like yeah shrewsbury shrewsbury you'd say both but it, it's always been Shrewsbury to me yeah. uh, because you can tell where I fit on the on the tier yeah. of 
class, I suppose. Um, and I think your Shrove's breeze are of a, a much higher breeding than me. Do you think there's a, a Telford accent? It's a Mongol accent. Yeah. I think we've adopted the Dawley Bis jockey lad kind of thing, um, which I think has become testament with Telford, but it's very much a Mongol town. And when I visit home and talk to my cousins, their Brummy accent is really broad, but people, if I work in Manchester, people will still take the mick out of my Brummy accent, but I don't see it as a Brummy accent. It's sort of a hybrid of Brummy versus Telford versus... I suppose popular culture plays a part in it as well. So things that, that Scott Mills is a, is a mate of mine who works on Radio One, and he's off of so off of as, as a sort of comedic play to getting it wrong deliberately. Yeah. And words like that then start to appear within our own cultural references. And I think if you look at dialogue over time, if somebody's saying something or it becomes a hook it kind of rubs off and then everybody says it then nobody says it again um but i was listening to a song the other day on the radio and it was a 60s song i'm trying to remember what the hook was now um but they were singing oh groovy the word groovy we wouldn't use the word groovy this day and age right. it's horrendous in the 70s groovy was cool groovy was the word yeah but now if you use it people are just like i think you've quoted lines out of austin powers <laughs> That's like um, fab as well, isn't it? I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Dialect, dialect log moves on, and actually, for kids, the idea is that we don't understand it, and as soon as we start to understand it, they change it, because we had words that our parents didn't get, and bad and sick, and six good, and you know, and that's ten, five years ago. There'll be kids watching this go, shut up, six so last decade. So it, it, we're always a bit behind, so we think we're down with the kids, but actually they've got their own dialogue and and that's something we do as well and um, one last thing i want to sort of mention to you about is have you heard about cindaloo cindu cindaloo well no go on cindaloo well cindaloo this is this is a bit of history that's sort of um, connected with ta- the talford area right. and also with shrewsbury sort of um, as well because um no old park yeah well old park and it was 1821 um, there was a bit of an uprising with um, miners because um, I think the, the wages were right. slashed yeah. by the local people. I think one of them was um, Thomas Botfield, who the right. yeah. place the they named after over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, they sent in the yeomanry and to um, to quell the uh, what they call the riot. Yes. Um, some people got killed and um, people got arrested, and um, and what happened is I think um, one by one the people who'd been arrested they sort of got the jail sentences commuted because they right, were they okay. were sort of sentenced to death yeah. uh, at the time uh, apart from one guy who um, didn't end up getting his um commuted and he was sort of hung at shrewsbury prison oh right okay um, i've guy... had a tour of the guy and that that room is pretty oh, yeah. horrendous yeah so yeah. Uh, tom palin his name was right. uh, and he was sort of um it, it was the only one that was sort of hung and right. it, it happened over there and the, and the people the local people at the time they said they called it um, a battle. They called it the Battle of Cindaloo. Right. Okay. Because so this was fighting for the rights. For the rights. Yeah. Because the old. Because the. I pe- suppose the, the the minor strike equivalent of that. Uh, day. Yeah. It was. Yeah. It was. It was equivalent of what happened in the eighties, and the um, the people there sort of um, because it was called Cindaloo because the area of old part there it was called um, Cinder Hill. Okay. Right, yeah. This, right. So. This, and they took the a hoo-ha sort of. of yeah, Cinder Hill. It was in Cinder Hill, so they sort of took on like the water, like the Battle of Waterloo. Um, they called it the the Battle of Cinderloo. Right. Okay. But also at the same time, I think in another part of the country had happened at a place called Peterloo. Right. Um, so it was the it was I suppose it was one of these things with the pits, wasn't it? So we had it in yeah. the eighties, but that that sort of generation where people yeah. couldn't afford to pay it, and then the miners' family that depended on that kind of money probably would cause the uprising yeah so what they're doing in this area now is there's uh, a group of people got together and they're going to um try and do something with it because the uh, the anniversary is coming up um in and, and that's, 2021 that's so important isn't it as well is is that history because that's a story i'd never heard yeah and there are so many stories that that are here for the first, and that's the beauty of doing what i do for a living i'll get sent on a radio job to to find out about this or to chat to somebody about this and it i'm a sponge of information i just love finding things out and talking yeah. to people and you know finding out the history or you know that there's a house at the bottom of priorsley lake because that was the original farm yeah. house and i love that kind of stuff 
and and that's why groups like this are really important because you share pictures you spe share history and you talk about it and there'll be people now that know all about the story that you've just told me yeah and the other people are going oh let's find out a bit more about that and i'm sure the group underneath the comments of this um will put pictures and and yeah. can kind of educate people and get in and that's why memories are so good because we've all got different ones different things are important to us but the common denominator is Telford it is where we live and what was important to us and the places and the things and the times which is why you know a site that you dreamed up as a way of sharing a few old snaps yeah. has suddenly become one of the biggest social networking groups within Shropshire yeah. because actually we've all got oh I remember that or do you remember that or have a look at this picture somebody put a picture on social networking about a month ago of me it was a, a pitch from Birmingham of a friend of mine and there was a team photo for us in that rec tournament that I talked about earlier. Yeah. I was 16 maybe, still lived in Birmingham and it's on the balcony at the ice rink and we're all in a big group. I'd never seen that picture in my life and if it wasn't for social networking groups like this yeah. I would never have seen it. It was just like, wow. And yeah, my hair was dodgy. <laughs> yeah, because a few have turned up in Cascades, haven't they? Yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Some really good ones. And, yeah. You know, and I've put some that I took because yeah. I had albums full of stuff when we used to do Beacon shows and stuff, and different stuff. And I've put a few on there, and there was some of me when I was DJing there, and some of Jonesy when Clive was there, and Adam Jackson who was at Sawyer's, and then you know, it, it, it's a very small knit community, but we were all servicing the same people of the yeah. same generation and you know we still knock about to this day and whenever nostalgia nights happen you know we're always playing together again which is quite nice if the, other than the fact that the others have all got kids and the next yeah. generation <laughs> coming up but let's, let's gloss over that have you, have you seen all the, the all these because um, on top of memories there's been sort of hundreds of reunions on there people yeah. sort of meeting school up reunions and, people meeting up people yeah. trying to track people, people down. yeah lost contact yeah. and they um i think there was one where they'd um sort of four ladies i think that sort of a picture went up of Rockwood Iron Wood School and isn't, all of a sudden they were talking. Isn't the irony about Facebook the fact that it all started with MySpace and Friends Reunited which yeah. none of them kind of took off to the extent and suddenly Facebook's like, oh, we're not another one and now there are more people watching this than we're watching, you know, if you if you, you looked at the stats of people watching cable TV channels and UK drama, uh, more for, there'll be more people watching this video now than watching that sitting on the phone. It's mind-blowing to how the sharing thing has gone and, and I'm in contact with my best mate when I was 12 through Facebook I hadn't seen him for 20 30 years suddenly he popped up on Facebook he's like oh how are you Dave and it's exactly <laughs> like we hadn't seen each other for three months maybe a year and you know so much time has passed and so much yeah. passion to it. we still haven't set eyes on each other but we talk to each other regularly that's the good thing about so I've, I've, I mean, Town for Memories is all about sort of bringing the community together. It's sort Absolutely. of Absolutely. And, and all, people from all over the world. It's like people listen to the radio in Australia. Yeah. They listen to Radio Shropshire because they want to keep in touch with what's happening back at home. And yeah. loads of expats do that. And Telford Memories, I bet there's a massive percentage of people that follow the Telford Memories site that haven't lived here for decades. Or yeah. Generations. Well, if you look on the stats, I think because uh, the first is the UK is the most people sort of thing. Yeah. Then it's sort of um, America yeah, gets further on there. Further. Then Australia. Yeah. Then the, the, if you can see people all over the world that used to live here and they've sort of moved away and but they want to keep in contact with what's going yeah. on in Telford. And it, it is great because they've got the same memories. They were around when we were around, but now they might live in. A, well, a mate of mine, Lee Planter, used to do some DJing over at the Ice in Australia now just like wow but wow that we're still in touch it's not unusual for people to go places but it's yeah. any unusual for them to stay in touch and say oh the weather's well it's probably otter here now at the moment yeah. but yeah we'll, in, in 50 years time we'll all be talking do you remember the summer of 2018 it was that hot it never rained yeah. for months it, it, you know they're now saying it's getting as hot if not hotter than 76 and yeah. people have been banging on about 76 <laughs> since 76 yeah Okay, Paul, it's been nice speaking to you. Thank you for chatting. It's been yeah. great fun. I hope I haven't bored you to death. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll get the people as well that come on afterwards. And the, the people in Australia, America, they are sort of come looking on here and they'll have a look through sort of um, afterwards. So thank you for today. Thank you very much and keep sharing those memories. Will do.